Welcome to Math TV with Professor V. This is continuation part two of the video on strategy for testing series. So we're basically just looking at a mix of different kinds of infinite series and determining which test to use to determine whether or not they are convergent or divergent. So here's the next example, example number four. We have the sum n equals two to infinity of one over n times square root of natural log of n. So I'm looking at this and I'm imagining in my mind, what's kind of popping out at me is uh, if this was a function, if I was trying to integrate this and I had one over x rad natural log of x, u substitution would work out nicely because the derivative of natural log of x is one over x, which I pretty much have right there. So I'm leaning towards the integral test. Um, why don't I like any of the other tests? Let's think here. Um, you could probably try a few others, but they're it looks like they're going to be inconclusive. Like I'm imagining doing limit comparison with harmonic and it's not going to work out. <laughs> so anyways, um, yeah, but sometimes you just have to go down that wrong path first. So that's totally okay. Anyways, let's do integral test. Remember, a n, these terms here are not integrable, so you have to define a function. So you're going to let f of x equal 1 over x rad natural log of x. And then we have to make sure that the conditions of the integral test are satisfied before proceeding. So the first thing is we have to make sure that this function is continuous where we're going to be integrating. We're going to be integrating from 2 to infinity. So how do we check if the function's continuous? Well, remember back in Calc 1, we had a theorem that told us that a whole bunch of functions, rational, radical, polynomials, trig, all those good stuff, um, exponential functions, logarithmic, they're continuous on their domain. So can you identify the domain of f of x? Well, the domain of f of x is going to be from 1 to infinity, not including 1, people, because ln of 1 is 0, and you can't have a 0 in the denominator. No, no, no. So the domain of f is from 1 to infinity. That means the function is continuous on 1 to infinity. So, of course, f is going to be continuous on the interval from 2 to infinity, where we're interested in integrating. So great, we're good to go. Next condition we have to verify is that f of x is positive on the interval that we're going to be integrating, which is from 2 to infinity. If you're not sure, let's think about it this way. Well, 1 over x, this portion right here, that's not going to be negative on 2 to infinity. What does natural log of x look like? Hopefully you remember the graph. Hopefully you didn't forget just yet. Remember the key point is that ln of x goes through 1, 0. But then past that point, whoop, it's positive. As it should be, otherwise how could you take the square root of it? So we're good to go. f of x is positive on 2 to infinity. And then the last thing, probably the trickiest, is you want to make sure f of x is decreasing on that interval. So how to check, I'm going to take the derivative. And before I start that, I'm going to rewrite f of x as x times rad ln of x to the negative first power. Okay. So <clears throat> here we go. f prime of x is going to be negative x rad ln of x to the negative second, right? I'm doing power rule, but in so doing, I'm going to have to do the chain rule. So there's negative 1. Keep what's inside the same. And then now by the chain rule, I'm going to multiply by the derivative of x times rad ln of x. So I have to do product rule. Derivative of <clears throat> x is 1. And then I'm going to leave rad ln of x alone. Plus, now I leave x alone. And then derivative of rad ln of x, that's going to be 1 over 2 rad ln of x. And then chain rule one more time, derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. All right, so all I want to know is, is this positive or not? So let's clean it up so I can tell right away. Let's put this first term in the denominator. And I'm going to square it too because it's going to turn into x squared and then just ln of x, no rad. And then here I have rad ln of x 
notice these x's cancel out so then I just have plus one over two rad ln of x. Okay, well, x squared times natural log of x on the interval from two to infinity, this is positive. Rad ln of x, that's gonna be positive, plus something else, that's positive. So this whole thing is positive. I have a positive times a positive and then one negative hanging out. Oh, that tells me this derivative, f prime, is less than zero. So therefore the function is decreasing, f is decreasing on two to infinity. So we're all clear, we can proceed now with the integral test, how fabulous. All right, so remember our integral is going to match, the limits on the integral will match the index of summation on the original series, so two to infinity. So what we're gonna try to integrate now is integral from two to infinity, one over x square root ln of x dx. Now, like I mentioned, we're gonna have to do a u substitution and it can get a little messy with this improper integral. So what I'm gonna do first is just consider an indefinite integral, one over x rad ln of x dx, I'll figure out the antiderivative and then I'll come back to the original problem and make sure my notation is just spot on, okay? So here we go, we're gonna do that u substitution, so let u equal natural log of x, and then du is one over x dx. So now I have integral one over rad u du. Beautiful, and then remember one over rad u that's u to the negative one half du. Add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, so that's gonna be two u to the one half plus c. And then I'm just gonna replace u with ln of x, so this is two rad ln of x plus c. So now I have my antiderivative already. What's nice is now I can go back to that improper integral and say it's gonna equal the limit as t approaches infinity integral, two to t, you must do that immediately, one over, straighten up, there we go, x radical ln of x dx. And I already have that antiderivative computed. So then this is gonna equal the limit as t approaches infinity and then now I'm gonna refer back up here. I'm not gonna use the plus C because I have these limits of integration here. So we have two rad at ln of x evaluated from two to T. See how that works so nicely? And then I didn't have to deal with switching the limits of integration in the U sub and all of that messiness. Okay. Now let's go ahead, evaluate upper limit minus lower limit. So we've got limit, t goes to infinity. Let's keep the two out of the picture, okay? It doesn't need to be plugged in every step of the way. Ln, rad ln of t minus rad ln of two. And then can you take this limit? We have the graph of natural log of x up above. Let's look at it again. So as x approaches infinity, it's easy to see. Ln of x is also approaching infinity. Just because you take the square root of something that's going to infinity, it's still gonna go to infinity, right? It doesn't stop it. So we have something going to infinity minus a number, rad ln of two. I don't care what it is, it's a constant though. It has no fighting chance against infinity. So this limit is going to infinity. And shoot, if you multiply by two, it's getting there just a wee bit faster. So this thing is going to infinity. That limit is infinite. So what does that tell me? That tells me that the integral diverges. This improper integral diverges. Therefore, the sum, n equals two to infinity, of one over n rad natural log of n also diverges by the integral test. All right, I know that was a lot 
for one problem, but it is what it is. Okay. Good. Let's look at another example. This one will make you feel better about yourself. It's not so difficult. Example five, we have the sum n equals zero to infinity, negative one to the n pi to the two n, ooh, how cute, over two n factorial. You guys, the minute I see a factorial, I my brain goes straight to ratio test, okay? There's no other test that helps those factorials cancel out nicely. It's just, it's a thing of beauty. So we're gonna consider, yeah, I like writing consider because it creates a logical explanation or layout for your work. Okay, limit as n goes to infinity. We have absolute value of a n plus one over a n. So let's see here. I'm going to have limit, n goes to infinity, absolute value of a n plus 1 is going to be negative 1 to the n plus 1, pi to the 2 times n plus 1 over 2 times n plus 1, and then factorial. Do you see how I'm putting the n plus 1 in parentheses? That is crucial, crucial, over negative 1 to the n pi to the 2n over 2n factorial. Okay, beautiful. Now let's clean it up. We're taking absolute value of all of this, so the negative 1 raised to whatever just goes away, because when you take absolute value, those are going to become positive 1 if they aren't already. So just dump them. You can ignore them. They are gone. Then we have limit n goes to infinity, nothing else is gonna be negative, so I don't need the absolute value anymore. Pi to the two n plus two, yes, I distributed. Did you catch that? Do -do -do -do. Over two n plus one factorial, so that's gonna be two n plus two factorial. And then times, I'm gonna multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator, right, since we're dividing by that. So we have here 2n factorial over pi to the 2n. All right, now break this down carefully. This is the limit. n approaches infinity. Pi to the 2n plus 2, I can write that as pi to the 2n times pi squared over 2n plus 2 factorial. That's 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1 times 2n, and I'm going to stop right there factorial because I see the 2n factorial on the other side of the fraction of the expression, boom, and then pi to the 2n. So nice. So now we have a little cancel party. Get the strobe lights out. So pi to the 2n, gone, and then 2n factorial, gone. And we should be in business shortly. So this equals the limit as n approaches infinity, pi squared over, do we want to multiply it out? We don't need to. 2n plus 2 over 2n plus 1. That's all that's left. Well, as n approaches infinity, this denominator is approaching infinity. And pi squared is just a constant sitting up there on the top. So a constant over infinity, that's going to go to zero. And what do I care about this limit? Well, we're using the ratio test, so I always compare it to one. So zero is definitely less than one, which tells me that the sum, n equals zero to infinity, always rewrite the original, negative one to the n, pi to the two n over two n factorial converges by the ratio test, okay? We're only checking for convergence or divergence, but the ratio test does also test for absolute convergence. So if you care, it not only converges, it converges absolutely. Every time you use the ratio test, unless it's inconclusive, you'll determine that the series diverges or it converges absolutely. Okay, one more cute one. This is number six. I have the sum 
n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over n cubed plus 1 over 3 to the n. Okay, you are not allowed to distribute a sum across the terms and break it up until you've determined that each of these individually is convergent. Okay, that's a big no-no. So you're just going to separately consider them. Oh, look at look at me in the consider back at it. Okay, so consider the sum n equals 1 to infinity. Let's just deal with that first term, 1 over n cubed. It should be familiar. This is a p series. p equals 3, which is greater than 1. Therefore, it converges. That's all you have to say. No one needs you to prove it again. Okay. What about that second term? So if I just consider the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 3 to the n. You guys, 1 over 3 to the n is the same as 1 third to the n, right? That's geometric. <gasps> How fabulous. So that means r, absolute value of r is absolute value of 1 third. That's less than 1. So it converges also. And now I am able to sum these two terms together and state the following. So now I can say, all right, that means the sum, n equals 1 to infinity, of 1 over n cubed plus 1 over 3 to the n converges also. If you want a little, we didn't use a test, right? You could just say because the sum of two convergent series is convergent. Okay. Now, what if one of them diverged and the other one converged? Like, what if instead of 1 over n cubed, if we had 1 over n, the harmonic? Woo, that's divergent. So then that would ruin it for everybody, and the whole sum would be divergent. Okay, so if one diverges and one converges, one term, mm -mm, the whole thing's going to diverge. Okay, good. So I'll stop the video here. I can do another part three, four, whatever you fancy. Stay tuned. Um, give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. Check out the rest of my channel. I have so many full length video lectures if that's what you're looking for or just short little quick tips too. Um, and if you're interested in what else I'm up to. <laughs> you can catch me on Instagram and TikTok at Math TV with Professor V. Take care, guys.